At this time, I'd like to welcome one of my fellow OC Forum board members, the one of a kind, Mike Ruane. Paul said he'd be brief today because we're very uh, we're very fortunate to have the new state treasurer here, and this has actually been an Orange County tradition to have the newly elected state treasurer uh, attend the Orange County Forum within the first six months of office, and this has been a great uh, commitment to that tradition. But I think today, as many of you are here, you know this is a special day because uh, in addition to the biography and other things that Fiona Ma will share with you in terms of her role as treasurer, there are three things you don't know about her. Uh, first, she is one of the few elected and public officials that actually understands that economic mobility and economic success for this state can involve public-private participation. It's going to require thoughtful thinking about how to investment and how scarce resources can be better leveraged. It's not just about spending money. Second, um, she is unquestionably uh, on a touring the state, speaking and talking to as many people as she can. But one of the things she does that's also unique, she listens. She's looking for great ideas. She's looking for what's going to work, what hasn't been working. And that is something that I think many of you are aware isn't always a trait with uh, people who come through. Uh, and third, my own experience uh, in my past life when I was heading up the Children and Families Commission and we were in the middle of a state recession. And right now the legislature has the privilege of finding out how to invest surplus dollars. Treasurer Fiona Ma was there when they had to really close ranks and protect the safety net. Everything was on the table. The kind of cuts that the state was making and having to make because of the budget shortfall could have had an even more dramatic impact on whether children would be able to start school healthy, whether uh, the deficit would cause impacts which would take 10 years to get dig out of. And in her role in the assembly, was able to help facilitate smart choices. There were tough choices but there were smart choices. And I think when you see someone in times of adversity, that's the best time to see how they come through. So I think it's very important we give an Orange County welcome to new state treasurer, Fiona Ma. Thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, coming out today, I had an opportunity to meet some of you earlier, so I know a little bit about what your interest is and why you are here today. So I'm going to try to tailor some of my remarks uh, toward some of the areas that you are interested in, and then I will leave time for question and answers in case I did not uh, cover all of your, um, your issues. So first off, I want to thank Jim for uh, introducing me. I had the opportunity of sitting on the National Corps uh, Board many years ago, back in 2002 to 2006, uh, where we built uh, affordable housing nationally. And I didn't know anything about affordable housing back then, but the founder, Jeff Burham, said, don't worry about it, just don't vote against me. So you know how that is. You get recruited to sit on boards, and you're like, why? And you're like, well, you're a good friend. You're a good friend, right? <laughs> so OK. So um, you know, through osmosis, uh, I did learn about our 9% tax credits and our 4% tax credits and how important it is to have social services incorporated on these um, communities because so many people do depend on it and how they revitalize um, different communities. Um, but before that, I started out as an accountant. I worked for Ernst & Winnie in the tax department uh, doing tax uh, real estate uh, tax for five years in the San Francisco office. 
Uh, in the meantime, I earned my CPA degree doing all of my audit hours. I got my master's in taxation, and then after five years, decided to leave and form my own practice. So I was 28 years old, and that was the first time I ever got involved in public service. I became president of a small business association. And again, you know, not understanding how uh, nonprofits work, um, two of the founders said, hey, you know what? It won't be a lot of work. We're not going to pay you. <laughs> but it would be a great opportunity for you to go meet more clients. So I said, OK. And so that was the Asian Business Association. And it actually became more time consuming than my regular CPA practice. Uh, but um, I started to get more and more involved uh, representing women and minority small business owners in particular, and started to understand that although small business is the backbone of the economy, it is really hard to run a small business here in California with all the rules and the regulations and the filings and the fines and the fees. Um, so that started me where I am here today, and that's still a big passion of mine. Along the way, I told my parents, you know, mom and dad, I want to run for office, any office. And my parents, you know, would say, well, no. You know, being an accountant is an honorable profession. Please don't go into politics. You don't even need a degree to run for office, right? So in my parents' mind, it's not, wasn't very good. So. They would say, well, you know, we want you to go get your MBA. You know, maybe you need to, you know, go back and see the world a little bit. And so I went and got my executive MBA uh, degree from Pepperdine University, 18 months, you know, over two years, every other weekend. And my parents, after I graduated, said, what do you think? And I said, well, I still want to run for office. And they're like, well... Okay, uh, your younger brother wants to get married, so we'd like you to get married. You're the oldest. <laughs> so I found a nice guy that my dad approved of. Engineer like him, played tennis with him, you know, half Asian. That made him happy. <laughs> and I said, Mom and Dad, you know, just let me. Can I just do one thing for myself? And they're like, okay, you know, if you want to do that, waste your life. Uh, <laughs> we're going to move to Las Vegas. <laughs> and so they did. And so that was the first time I was able to do something for me. Um, 36 years old, I ran for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Uh, there were seven other candidates in the race, and I won, uh, number one, because I worked harder than everybody else. Number two, I didn't want my parents to say, I told you so. <laughs> and number three, I really didn't want to go back and do taxes anymore. So four years on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, hated it. It was like the game show survivor. <laughs> 11 members. I was the second woman. Uh, the other woman was a nice African-American grandma from the Bayview Hunters Point. And um, we just weren't prepared to fight, you know, with the men every day. And so after four years, I decided to run for the state assembly. And I thought I died and went to heaven. It was amazing to be in the legislature, right? I played sports all of my life, and I really enjoyed team sports. So when you go to the legislature, it's all about the team. You're either a Democrat or a Republican. You're in the assembly or in the Senate. You're in the legislature against the governor. You know, California against, you know, the US, right? <laughs> Um, so you're always like on a team, you know where you know you are and you know if you're a Democrat here in California, it's pretty good because you're like on the winning team uh, most of the time. Uh, so I got there and I got appointed majority whip by then speaker Fabian Nunez. Two years later, Karen Bass was my speaker, she kept me as majority whip. Two years later, John Perez was the speaker. He appointed me to speaker pro tem. I served under two governors, Arnold Schwarzenegger, if you remember, back in 2006, and then Jerry Brown, and as Jim said, then the Great Recession hit in 2008. So it wasn't a happy time, 
Um, my four years on the Board of Supervisors, my six years in the Assembly, I never saw a surplus. So, you know, when you operate in a deficit, you're always trying to, like, save money, make money go further, right? Um, there's not much to give. You're fighting over the crumbs. But it taught me very good lessons, that money is not always available, and it also made us evaluate which programs and services were the most important here in the state. It also taught me how to manipulate a budget because we took all the gas tax money because the roads did not have any lobbyists and we essentially took that money and funded it back to all of the social service programs that people uh, depend on. Uh, but it was, um, it was still a great time. I got 60 bills signed by two different governors. Uh, most of them didn't cost a lot of money, right? Surprise. Uh, so after uh, six years, I faced forced retirement called term limits. My parents by this time had moved back to California. They were actually living with me. Uh, I thought temporarily, but it became a permanent situation. <laughs> and my dad would say, okay, this is a great opportunity for you to go make some money, finally, you know? Uh, go back and be of counsel, work for one of the big four accounting firms. And I said, no, Dad, I am going to run for the State Board of Equalization. And so he said, what is that? And I said, well, go look it up, Google it. And so he did, and he's like, oh, okay, tax board, that's not bad. <laughs> Didn't know what it was because it's the only elected tax board in the nation, so there's no, like, similar... Uh, comparison, we were not in the news back then very much. These days, we're in the news a lot. Uh, but I ran for the Board of Equalization, uh, representing 10 million people, uh, 23 counties from the Oregon border all the way down to Santa Barbara. And the board at the time uh, equalized, equalized property taxes, but also uh, oversaw about 35 different tax and fee programs, sales tax, alcohol tax, cigarette tax, any other tax that is not uh, income tax was by the Board of Equalization. Uh, so um, it was okay for the first year, and then the second year, uh, we started to question practices, right? Like all of a sudden we heard all these people were related. How does state government have so many people that are related in one building? Uh, RFPs, I would say, hey, we're issuing RFP, like, can I see the RFP? Like, there's no RFP, people just get hired, right? Um, so all these little things that I was, you know, sure wasn't right. Uh, when I became chair, I asked for three outside audits to be done, and it did reveal that a lot of shenanigans was happening. The governor took over the tax and fee programs and then formed a new Office of Tax Appeals for all of the appeal cases. And so that left us at the Board of Equalization with not much to do, basically. Uh, so you will see it may be on the ballot to uh, dissolve the Board of Equalization uh, as it is because it was um, initiated in 1879 by the voters. And as you know, the only way to get rid of a voter initiative is to put it back on the ballot. So that uh, may be coming back next year. And I just said, okay, what am I gonna work on? Well, one thing that we collected taxes on was the cannabis industry. And I don't know about you, any of you in the cannabis industry? Smoke some pot when you were young? <laughs> I don't know, okay? It was a long time for me, but I was like, wow. California, like, has cannabis, right? I grew up in New York, where the cannabis was not very good. And apparently out here, it was like the green rush, right? We have an emerald triangle in my district. I started doing tours, and I started understanding, you know, these plants grow over 10 feet tall. Um, I, you know, there, people are making, you know, millions of dollars. They're bringing bags of cash into our offices to pay their taxes. Uh, and one thing I found out was they can't bank. They can't legally open up a bank account. So I started, you know, going, why can't they bank? It's un-American. I would start, you know, going to Congress and asking about the tax laws, any way we can go around, maybe cryptocurrency or... Um, and I started 
you know, being that cannabis banking person. And so when John Chung decided to run for governor, I said, well, I want to be the banker. I want to be the treasurer. Like, I want to get this stuff banked, right? We cannot follow a cash trail as auditors. And there are a lot of people that aren't paying their taxes because when you go in and audit them, they say, we don't have any money. We don't have any books. We don't have a bank account. We don't have credit card statements. How do you audit them, right? So uh, that's how I started really uh, wanting to be the California state treasurer. When I brought that up to my dad, my dad's like, that's great. <laughs> yes, you know, my daughter being the banker of the fifth largest economy, go for it. That was the first time my dad encouraged me to ever do anything in politics, by the way. So he was helping and he was all excited, you know, voting. And, um, but I got elected uh, last year and I started on January 7th. So this is my fifth year in uh, office as your 34th treasurer. And I have to say, I've been doing this a long time, but I didn't even know what the treasurer's office really did. Okay, you ready to get your mind blown? Okay. <laughs> Over $2 trillion dollars goes through my office every year. I am the state's banker, okay, $2 trillion. I am managing over $100 billion in state investments as well as many local jurisdictions, maybe Buena Park, I think we manage Buena Park's money as well. I oversee $90 billion of bonds. That's a lot of bonds. And I also chair 16 boards and commissions I sit on 10 other boards, namely CalPERS, CalSTRS, the California Earthquake Authority, and I still oversee all the bonds that are still open here in California, so about 35 different bond committees. So that is amazing. I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm excited every time I talk about trillions and billions of dollars, you know, that like I control and I manage and I see and I can, um, you know, move around sometimes. Uh, but this spring, you know, Jerry Brown did not like to issue bonds, you know. As, as you know, he was very fiscally conservative and, you know, right man for the right time. But everybody, I know there's some school construction bond folks here that are like, why aren't we issuing these bonds? Well, this spring I did issue nine different bonds, uh, about $6.8 billion, and they were oversold and oversubscribed. And so we did really, really good for the state of California. Uh, I was able to refund two big general obligation bonds and able to save the state uh, close to $2 billion over the next 19 years because Back in 2010, the rates were 6%. Today, the rates are under three, so we're able to save some money. So I would call Gavin and go, hey, Gavin, I'm saving you money. Can you like leave some for me? I have to tell you, I'm begging for money just like everybody else here in this room. Um, but uh, as I was saying to some of my folks, you know, we had a great bond sale this spring. We're gonna go out again. Uh, for another $4 billion in the fall, and then probably another $4 billion in the spring if things hold up. Um, but that is good news for California. Our credit rating also is doing well. Um, Wall Street, you know, is, uh, is, is positive about uh, the state of California. I also oversee uh, the affordable housing tax credits. How many of you are in the affordable housing business? care about housing, want more housing, need more housing. Okay, so I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes um, just talking about housing. Uh, so when I first started, um, we vacated the executive director positions for TCAC and SIDLAC, which are my main housing financing uh, arms, 9% and 4% tax credits. We did a five city listening tour to hear what um, people wanted. Uh, we also got involved in the opportunity zones. So the governor's office uh, wants to align our taxes with the federal opportunity zone tax incentives, which I think is a great idea because that would encourage more investments here in California. So we have been working closely with the GoBiz office. They're doing the policy and we are doing the outreach, trying to match 
projects with investors. So if you all have shovel-ready projects but uh, have been you know, short on a little bit of money in an opportunity zone, please let us know. Uh, we also recently listed uh, the job postings for the director for SIDLAC and TCAC. Uh, we didn't get enough interest in SIDLAC, so we have extended that uh, job opening. But if any of you, Becky Clark, where's Becky? Want to come back? Becky, I'm, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm trying to move the 4% and the 9% under TCAC and pay the director more. Just saying. <laughs> also a good idea, I know. That's been a problem. Um, we also gonna make uh, reg reforms uh, to our regulations and we uh, started out saying, hey, we're just gonna you know, call some stakeholders together and you know, get some input. And our lawyer, who's a great lawyer but a little conservative, says, well, you may have, you know, Brown Act violations, or you may have to um, post the agenda, and it may be open to the public. You may have to televise it, or all that stuff. So we're like, okay, forget it. We're not going to do that. We're going to get around it by going back to the communities that we didn't go to initially for our housing tours. Um, and we're just gonna take public comment from all of you at these different meetings and then incorporate that as our meetings um, for ideas. So June 13th will be in Oxnard and Bakersfield, June 14th, Riverside and LA, June 20th, San Diego and Anaheim. So Anaheim, back here on June 20th, June 27th, Reading, Sacramento, June 28th, Fresno and San Jose. So we are gonna hope to um, um, get some ideas. We have to go through the public comment period and hopefully by late fall, we will have uh, some reg reforms um, to, our, to our housing policies. So that's that on housing. I know another issue that people are interested in was ScholarShare, ScholarShare 529. Anybody have a ScholarShare 529 plan? Yes. Um, so I oversee, I chair the ScholarShare uh, 529 plan and we have been giving out money for the last three years to schools in California. And these schools, uh, everybody is eligible, uh, but they have to vote. So it has to be their parents, you know, their relatives, anyone over 18. So there are four schools that are receiving free money, unattached, um, they're getting the money, they can spend it the way they want, we're not gonna ask them for a report, uh, but Buena Park, Mabel, Pendleton Elementary, $10,000 for STEM and STEAM. Cyprus, uh, Juliet Morris Elementary is getting $20,000 for school supplies. Huntington Beach, Ethel Dwyer Middle School getting $25,000 for enrichment programs. And Garden Grove, Patton Elementary School is getting $25,000 for technology equipment. So see what I love my job? I'm giving out money too. But next year, if your schools or school districts want to compete, uh, this is a great program. So I'm trying to get the word out that um, it is competitive and the parents and the PTA and the communities, they love it, but they have to vote every day for two weeks. And whichever school gets the most amount, most amount of votes wins the money. Not too hard, right? But it's you know teaching the kids also that voting matters and voting works. So that's why I like going to these schools. Um, and then we also have a, a bill on ScholarShare right now. Ian Calderon and I have a bill to give a tax deduction for people who open up a ScholarShare uh, 529 account, right? Because we, the tax reform limited our SALT deductions to $10,000. We're hoping that people will open up ScholarShare accounts for their kids or their grandkids uh, and also get a tax deduction. How, how's that? We need more. Um, another program that uh, folks have asked about is CalSavers. Uh, CalSavers is a new program that started this year for any employer an employee, so if you're an employer and you do not offer a pension plan to your employees, you will eventually have to enroll your employees into our CalSavers program. 
and it will be administered by my office, by professional advisors. Uh, they can choose the type of allocations um, they want to, um, um, to use, and it is portable with the employee. So if an employee leaves your, your company or your nonprofit, they can take their pension, their account CalSAVERS with them. So it's an important program. If you uh, want us to come talk about it, uh, we're also working with uh, cities uh, in terms of partnering them with our CalSAVERS and scholarship programs. And I thank Buena Park again uh, for signing up for all of our, our programs. Um, let's see. And then CHAFA, our California Hospital Financing Authority. I know um, Jenna is here from the Children's Hospital. We're giving money out to the Children's Hospital. It's not a competitive program. Every, every Children's Hospital, I get excited. Every Children's Hospital gets money, and so Children's Hospitals, you know, uh, really are doing God's work. Uh, we also have the California School Financing Authority that finances um, um, finances charter schools. Um, so any charter schools uh, in your district that would like to expand uh, or start, uh, please call us. And then I also, as I mentioned, uh, with the bonds, issued $180 million uh, to, to CalVet. Uh, CalVet is an amazing program that helps veterans buy homes, amongst other things. And so if you know a vet who was not dishonorably discharged, um, this loan is available, no down payment is necessary, will help with the closing costs, not dependent on your FICO score, uh, very low interest loan, and the loan amount is based on the ability to pay. So you don't need a W-2 job, but whatever, even if you have social security or uh, uh, SS, uh, disability, you could qualify for a CalVet. So come and get it while there's money. Um, and we're also doing outreach seminars. Uh, when I was on the Board of Equalization, that was very popular. Every month we would go to a different district and do a free uh, workshop for either small businesses, nonprofits, veterans, um, or specialty uh, in language um, as well. And so we are uh, continuing to do that. We've had two. Uh, seminars so far. Tomorrow we will be in Hacienda Heights. Um, so if you would like us to come and bring experts uh, to your community, we just help ask that you help us find a location and do a little outreach um, to get folks to turn out. So I am going to stop here and see if folks have any questions. Um, otherwise, I can continue to go on and on and on. Uh, my chief of staff, Genevieve Jopanda, wants to be recognized right now. So I'm recognizing my chief of staff, Genevieve Jopanda. What? Oh, that's a good idea. OK. And I want to recognize Gloria Polito, who was part of my outreach team. and also worked uh, with John Chung when he was state controller as well as state treasurer here in the LA office. So one other one, um, CDAC, our California Debt and Investment Advisory uh, Council is funded through the bonds that we issue. And the purpose is to educate, uh, educate not only public finance officials at the city, county, and special districts, but also to educate elected officials. And I know, even though I have an accounting and finance background, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, I didn't understand how everything worked, right? You have a budget, but you have bonds, and you have grants, and you have loans, and, and you have reimbursements from the federal government and the state government. Uh, so we um, put together a module for local governments. So for people like Melissa Fox on the Irvine City Council. Um, and we are gonna hopefully put together a nine module program that folks can get a certificate after. But it's really to better educate local elected officials uh, when they come into office so that there's not as much pressure on like city managers, right? <laughs> Jim, yes. Okay. How about a round of applause for Fiona Ma? Thank you very much. And we do have time for questions. Does anybody have a question? We can come around. We've got one over here. 
Uh, Pete Weitzner with Chapman University and the Orange County Business Journal. First, I want to say how refreshing it is that a top finance officer in the state is a CPA. I think our controllers have not even been CPAs. So thank you, and thank you for an entire policy address with not five seconds of partisanship in it. That was also refreshing. I'm wondering also on the bonds, um, how much the market has driven you to be pushing school bonds for, for now because I hear on the other side, investors, money managers, that's what their clients are hungry for and they're just not out there. The I supply know. of muni bonds, so did that all, and it seems there's room to grow the coming eight billion to an even higher number. Yeah, um, well, the governor every year starts with his budget. Um, we know what bonds are coming due, so that's why I know that there's a $2 billion general obligation bond coming due in the fall, another $2 billion in the spring, but clearly it's not enough for everybody's appetite. Uh, the governor also puts in his wish list, based on his departments, right, Department of Water Resources and um, whoever wants money for their projects, and then he uh, puts together a budget, and then it goes through the Assembly and the Senate committees, and then he has a May revise, which just came out last week, and the May revise showed that uh, our revenues are $3 billion over um, what was expected because of the um, um, the good April 15th quarter that we had, right? People are making money, stock market is good, so our April 15th numbers are really good. Um, yes, there's not enough bonds out there, but we also have to watch what is going on, right? I can't predict the future. I don't want to say the future because I'm not allowed to move the market by what I say, but you know, we've had 10 years of prosperity. Um, we hope it continues, but if not, then we have to also make sure that we can pay back uh, the bond indebtedness. That is important because that ranks um, at, at the top in terms of you know, what debts need to be paid first, and so that's why we probably don't issue as much as we probably could, but you know, in the future we need to make, back, make sure we're paying it back. Okay, question number two from uh, table nine. Yes, thank you very much for being here. The uh, question is a uh, follow-on with what you just said. You know, we've had uh, six really good years of revenue going to the state, you know, long prosperity. Uh, <clears throat> but that doesn't go all the time. So uh, a good portion of the money coming to the state of California comes from the profits or stock options and stock you know, transfers, uh, a very substantial portion of the general income tax. Uh, if that dries up and we have Prop 98, which is locked in money going to schools, have you come up with a plan and how we're going to continue on with the programs we're enacting and how are we going to address the biggest elephant in the room, which is the underfunded pensions and CalPERS and STRS? Yeah, um, a couple things. Uh, yes, about 90% of our state's general funds comes from personal income tax, corporation tax, and sales taxes. So that's why we're doing better is because all of those taxes are coming in over, um, over ex expectations. And back in 2008, when we had the Great Recession, all of those three were down, and that's what happened. We saw a $40 billion deficit overnight. Uh, there are a lot of proposals out there. If you follow the legislature, everybody has an idea. Um, some of them will be on the ballot next year. Um, whether you like it or not, um, I think everybody needs to weigh in. Uh, my preference is to figure out instead of having to tax people more, you know, how do we bring in more revenues? That's why I'm excited about banking the cannabis industry. It's anywhere from an eight to $20 billion industry. And we were expected to generate about a billion dollars in extra revenues from the industry, but we are far, far short. I think we're at $400 million. But if we can bank the industry, then that would provide an additional source. I have also been working with 
working with. Uh, Amazon, how many of you order off of Amazon here in the room? We all do, I know my husband loves getting a box every day. <laughs> but I found out that Amazon doesn't collect any local tax on any of the purchases and they only collect the state portion for 50% of the products they own. So I have been trying and asking nicely of Amazon to please collect all the state and local tax. And they basically kind of shined me on for five years. But now because of the Wayfair Supreme Court case, uh, starting, we just passed a bill, so starting, what is it, when are we starting, June? June 1st, um, every seller who sells on the internet is going to have to collect and remit all the state and local taxes. So that has been a big uh, hole for local governments, all the internet sales, you know how people, brick and mortars have been complaining that it's not fair, you know, people come in and they look at a product and they order it online, they don't have to pay taxes, well, that loophole is gonna close. So I believe more money is gonna come in that way. And of course, refunding, I've been refunding and so that's adding more money into the coffers. So I prefer to kind of work in like the tax incentive area, right? Uh, instead of, you know, taxing more, um, just because I'm a tax accountant and I know how sensitive people are to taxes and how people and companies make their decisions based in some part, based on the taxes they pay, right? And uh, how expensive it is, the quality of life. Uh, so that is one half of your question. Um, I'm not proposing any magic bullet or any type of initiative or bill that is pending right now, but um, there's always bills that are seeking to bring in more revenues. The unfunded liability, I do sit on CalPERS and CalSTRS, uh, Governor Brown made a number of reforms back in 2012 to 13, I think. It's called PEPRA. They're small reforms. Um, they are uh, prospective because, you know, we don't believe we can go retroactive. Uh, but we believe we will be fully funded by 2050, 2045 in CalSTRS. Um, so there is a plan for, you know, being fully funded. But I always say, back, what, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, people retired at 55 and the life expectancy was 65. Now people still retire at 55, but the life expectancy is 95, right? And that is why the unfunded liability has increased a lot. But like your home mortgage, how many of us own a home mortgage? That is an unfunded liability, but we don't have to pay it right away. We just have to make sure we're paying the principal and interest, right, through whatever the 20 year, 30, 40 year uh, time period. And that's how I see our pension system as well. It is unfunded, yes, but it doesn't mean we have to come out of pocket tomorrow for the billions of dollars. We just have to manage, right? how much we are um, uh, generating. And we have set a 7% uh, rate of return, our goal for both CalPERS and CalSTRS. And as long as we, I know, you're going, wow, you must be a finance guy. Uh, but as long as we make 7% every year, then we are able to continue uh, to, um, you know, to, to fund our current and uh, retirees uh, in both of those systems. And the way we get there is, an allocation of uh, public equities, real estate, and now the two funds are getting aggressively into private equity because that's the only asset class that has shown it could generate over the 7%. So um, that's what we're working on, um, cross our fingers. Um, but we, um, we, I'm not worried. That's not what keeps me up at night, CalPERS and CalSTRS. We have another question here at table nine. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. So I'm uh, Doug Tipping with uh, Commercial Bank, uh, California Bank and Trust. And so with your tax background and the state incurring uh, large budget surpluses and even more so based on the revenue, has the state considered lowering income tax for individuals and corporations, uh, especially in light of the SALT going away or being limited, which is uh, 
personally hurt me quite a bit? Uh, the short answer is no. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's amazing because, you know, I, I, I found that that would be, um, you know, intuitive, right? Like when things go up, you give a refund back, or when things go up, you decrease. But it doesn't seem to be that case in California. So, um, no, there is no real push to decrease the individual or corporate income tax in California, fortunately. Do we have another question? Anyone else? Mike, you have a question? No, she's too smart. Oh, no. <laughs> Those are great questions. Here, now the hands go up. Let's start over here at table six. What does keep you up at night? <laughs> yes. Uh, a recession keeps me up at night. Um, that's what keeps me up at night, yeah, because I've been there before and it's not happy. You know, nobody's happy, you know, people suffer, um, you know, it affects our, our credit, and so that's what keeps me up at night. Here we go. Another question here now at table two. So, Fiona, there's been a lot of controversy over the years around the cap and trade program, um, and it didn't start off particularly strong, but recently has obviously been doing much better. Do you see that that's uh, gaining steam and we'll think it will continue um, in terms of the, because it really does help uh, from, from, from my seat, uh, the affordable housing programs and the money coming from that is incredibly helpful. I know it goes a lot of different places, but that's yeah. one place where it goes. Yeah, um, I, I do think the cap and trade program is doing well. Uh, there's a lot of um, dependence on that program to continue uh, to, to fund various pro projects that uh, people want. So I, I don't see that uh, as a, an issue. I am glad that Governor Newsom put more money into the affordable housing, the 4% tax credit, uh, middle income uh, housing, for example. Uh, we are now talking about funding infrastructure, whether it's a grant or a revolving loan program. And personally, I'm trying to replenish my $60 million in Brownfield remediation fund through the Cal reuse. Uh, so I think the stars are aligned in terms of this affordable housing crisis, um, that we need housing for all different uh, levels, not only you know the homeless, um, the low affordable, we need it for workforce housing, we need it for students, we need it for teachers, uh, we need it for seniors. Um, and as someone who is an AARP member now, and with no kids, uh, I'm going to have to depend on l living someplace that is hopefully going to be walkable and accessible and um, you know livable in a community. Um, so I think affordable housing for seniors that are on fixed income is definitely going to be uh, the next trend. And our office, Jovan Ag, if you haven't met him, he is my deputy overseeing housing and economic development. I've really streamlined about six different boards and commissions under him so that we can better leverage uh, some of the dollars that are out there because I know now that developments are using the 4% and the 9% in like one complex, you know, one building and also, you know, using city and county dollars, health dollars. Um, and that's how it's going to have to be because it is expensive to build here in California. But we want folks to stay here. Jobs are locating here, so that means we have to, you know, build to accommodate um, the workforce. But I do really would like to see more senior assisted living, um, uh, disabled type of housing to meet the needs as we get older. One more time, let's thank uh, the Honorable Fiona Ma. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Just a couple quick notes. If you need a parking voucher, Stephanie will have them at the back. See Stephanie for a parking voucher. I want to th once again thank our sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. Our board members that are here today, again, I want to thank you and be recognized for being here today. Finally, our next program is June 4th at the Diamond Club with the Angels. We hope you can join us there. Have a great day, everyone. Bye now. <laughs>